All right, good evening, everybody. My name is Professor Scott Mora, and this is the Civil and Environmental Engineering Town Hall. We're gonna begin with a quick introduction, and we're gonna start on this end with Professor Philippou. Hi, everybody. I am uh, Philip Philippou. I am Professor of Structural Engineering, and I have been in Berkeley for 32 years on the faculty and for five more years as a graduate student. I teach courses in computer analysis of structures, and I enjoy them very much because they expose students to analyzing structural systems, which is something that they have seen very little before when they get to my course. So juniors and seniors enjoy the course tremendously. Hi, everyone. My name is Joan Walker. I'm a professor here in the uh, transportation program. And I joined the faculty here in 2008, but a long time ago, more years than I'm willing to admit, I was in your position and I was trying to decide where to go to graduate school. I actually came here as an undergrad and had such a great experience that I've come back and uh, am happy, thrilled to be here actually. So I teach uh, in infrastructure planning and management class for undergrads and my research is actually all about the humans in the system. So when you think of civil infrastructure, we're building the system to make people's lives better, improve quality of lives, and they react to the system. So when we model the system, we have to understand their reaction. We can't control how they're going to react. So that's what I teach in my undergrad class. All right. So once again, my name is uh, Professor Scott Mora. This is actually my first year on the faculty. Uh, so the undergrad class I teach is called Civil Environmental Engineering Systems Analysis. And it's a course that's essentially on optimization, but in particular, we study optimization in different infrastructures like the water supply network, energy portfolio for the state of California, construction scheduling, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, my research interests are actually at the intersection of the energy infrastructure and the transportation infrastructure. And some of the things we find very compelling and study are electrified transportation and, and smart grids. And actually like Professor Joan Walker here, I too was an undergraduate. <laughs> Uh, so I was in your shoes as, as well, in fact. A little more recently. <laughs> uh, a bit more recently. What's funny is actually I've spent more years here as an undergrad than a faculty member, so I have both perspectives. Uh, I was also in the Cal Marching Band, so um, also spent some time doing engineering and extracurricular activities. So that's me. Hi, I'm Sophia Hamilton. I'm a junior, and I'm doing my emphasis within civil engineering and environmental engineering. And currently, outside of classes, I'm involved with the Civil Engineering Honor Society, Chi Epsilon. Um, I'm the secretary for that, which has been really fun. And I'm also involved in running a student taught course for freshmen called the Insider's Guide to Berkeley Engineering, um, which has been really fun. You get to mentor freshmen and help them find their way through Berkeley. And I also just love being outdoors and riding my bike. And my name is Curtis Siegfried. I'm also a junior. Um, by making my emphasis in my classes on structural engineering. I'm currently in Professor Philippou's class and I love it. It's a lot of fun. Um, outside of the classroom, my main involvement is with the Steel Bridge team, which is one of our five competition teams. I am currently the assistant project manager. I'm also a member of the Civil Engineering Honor Society Chi Epsilon with Sophia. Hi, I'm Joan Chamberlain. I'm the undergraduate advisor for the department. I've been on campus for 30 years um, and I really out of the four different jobs I've had on campus, this has been my favorite because I get to work with directly with students. I'm the person that when you have questions about which classes work with other classes or how to put your schedule together or maybe which faculty member might be doing research, how to get involved with a competition team, I'm the resource that you can come to. Great, so as you can see, we've uh, assembled a panel uh, with a variety of different perspectives and a variety of different positions, so uh, I think you'll get uh, your questions answered from various perspectives. And, and the first general topic that we want to go into is how faculty work with students. So why don't we start on this end and if you could talk a little bit about how you uh, work with your students. So at the undergraduate uh, level, I think students uh, work with faculty uh, by first uh, seeking advice, whether the advice has to do with coursework at the, in the earlier years, whether the ad advice has to do with certain um, uh, life choices, and then whether the advice has to do with career. At the same time, several of us serve as advisors to undergraduate teams. I serve as the advisor of the seismic team. So the seismic team this year is constructing a model of a 29-story building out of balsa wood. 
which will be competing with uh, similar buildings from other universities at the National Conference on Earthquake Engineering in Alaska in August. And uh, I really enjoy my work with the students tremendously because we get the chance to do things outside the classroom, which is a little bit more free, free, um, free reign for everybody. So, Joan, can you say a few words about? Uh, sure. So, I mean, the students are the energy of this place, particularly the undergrads. Uh, and a lot of our job is interacting with undergrads, so certainly through the courses, uh, through office hours, but also through research. So this is a research institution as much as it is an educational institution. I was a researcher as an undergrad here many years ago. And, um, and so students come, if they're interested in doing research, you just find a faculty who's doing something of interest, you go and talk to them. And it's easy for us to put undergrads on our research team. So I've had undergrads working on my smartphone tracking uh, project where we design apps that go on smartphones and then we can track people's movements with their knowledge, of course. There's all sorts of human subjects protections, but we track them, we figure out where they're going, we figure out what mode they're going on, and then we feed back to them information like how much time and cost and uh, greenhouse gas emissions and calories they're spending while traveling. And then we feed that information back to them, hoping that they'll be more thoughtful about their transportation and make more sustainable decisions. So we've had quite a few undergrads with us uh, programming Android apps and iPhone apps, and they've just been a great resource on the project. And Sophia, you're currently an undergraduate student, and you said you're focusing on environmental engineering. Can you talk about your interaction with the faculty from a student perspective? Yeah, so the faculty here are so accessible and really friendly, so you can always talk to them about your classes and office hours or just ask them about advice about grad school or your future, and it's really easy to get involved with research, too. I'm currently working on some research with my advisor, Professor Variano, about how reeds wave in the wetlands and how that would affect mixing in the water and how methane gets emitted from the wetlands. So it's been cool that you can just get involved in a project like that pretty easily here on campus. Curtis, why don't you add in your perspective as well? Um, I can just echo what Sophia said in that the faculty are very open during office hours. If you have questions about class and just other topics as well, you can always go ask them questions to clarify something that was said during lecture. Um, and the, but my main interaction with professors actually comes a lot with the Seal Bridge team when we go to ask advice of our professors if we don't have a strong understanding of what's going on in our design or want advice on how to improve our design and just make things stronger. And they're very open with helping the competition teams and helping us succeed. Great, thanks Curtis. And, and Joan, you're the key person who often connects <laughs> these students with faculty. So can you, can you talk about that process? Well, I just find that, fa I mean, it, it's something I really appreciate about faculty when, for example, when the seismic team was struggling and I went to Professor Philippu and I said, they really need an advisor. And he, you know, he didn't say to me, well, I don't have time and I'm so busy. He, he just took it on. And the other week I was walking out of my office and I saw this ball, huge balsa wood structure and they were sitting in the middle of the seventh floor, all the students talking with him and it was such an engaged conversation. Um, and I see that a lot with students, like, very engaged with faculty, just casually in conversation. Mm -hmm. So the next topic is on career preparation. I actually want to start with the students on this one. So I'm going to start with you, Curtis. So can, can you talk a bit about how you think uh, uh, the, the department here has helped prepare you for your future career? Um, I think the department has helped a lot. If just the professors giving advice about how to enter the industry, a lot of professors have worked in the industry or have a lot of contact within, within the industry, and so helping us get in contact with people. Um, also, through the career or through the student competition teams help to host a career fair every year, and so that's a great way to get to know different civil engineering companies within the Bay Area. And I found I currently have my internship for the summer that I found through that career fair, so it definitely helps in career prep and getting us involved with the people within the industry. And how about you, Sophia? What's been your experience? Um, yeah, I guess I've had a pretty similar experience to Curtis, but I would just add that we also have a lot of info sessions on campus. And every almost every single Tuesday, there's a civil engineering info session, which are really cool because you can go and hear about a company and get free food. And a lot of my friends have just signed up to get an interview with that company right there at the info session. And a lot of them get internships that way. And there's just a lot of recruiting on campus in general. I got my internship for the summer through some on-campus recruiting really early in the year. So it's a great place to be because it's really easy to find a job or internship here. 
So I believe Joan Chamberlain has some golden nuggets on this topic. <laughs> well, it's just, um, in addition, our American Society of Student Engineers hosts such things as um, resume workshops, and we've had the Career Center come in and conduct, you know, how to do an interview, and also like how to negotiate a salary workshop. Um, and also, the Career Center actually, because we're quite a ways away from them, has um, an outreach center every Wednesday in the Engineering Student Services Office where they critique students' resumes. And they host things such as dinner with professionals, so how you would go and sit down and eat and conduct yourself at a professional dinner. So I think there's a lot of options on campus to improve yourself professionally. Joan, can you talk about the Professional Development Certificate Program? Yes, that was uniquely started about five years ago, and that was to give students um, more of a, an opportunity to uh, gain professional skills. So in the freshman year, there's a decal course where they um, teach students, again, resume writing, um, interview workshops, um, those kinds of skills. They bring people in from the outside who, who routinely interview students, so they give them tips about that. And then, they, in addition, they take our required courses, which are CE92, which exposes students to the different areas of civil engineering, and then 192, which is the senior ethics course. And then there's also the 198, where students actually go into a company and they critique the company and write a professional paper about the company, and such as a, um, I'm losing the word for it right now, but a professional company might do, and then they present that paper. So they gain the skill of being able to not only write a paper and have that critiqued, but actually present the paper in front of a group of professionals. Great, thanks. Let me uh, open up the last few minutes here to, uh professors here and ask what their thoughts are. So my thoughts are that, uh, of course, in Berkeley, one has the benefit of a very well-known internationally program that has some of the most outstanding alumni uh, of any program in the United States and certainly around the world. And these alumni, of course, reach back to the faculty and the students when they are seeking new employees. So we are getting very often requests from former students about uh, recommendations for current students, and I feel that the opportunities that these alumni give to our students are really unparalleled in the world. So in terms of opportunities, I think there is no better place to come. Yeah, I definitely second that. And then just add another way we interact with students on the career planning is that they come and talk to us in our office hours or different times, grab us in the hall, and the students can have a wide range. Some of them know exactly what they want and where they're headed, and it's a matter of making sure they have the right contacts and who to talk to. Some students aren't quite sure. They're interested in a lot of different areas in civil engineering, or maybe, heaven forbid, outside of civil engineering. But the, um, you know, so part of that is just having that conversation with them about what excites them and where, you know, what different career paths would lead to. And so there's a lot of discussion like that that goes on too. I'll actually third that comment. I pretty consistently get uh, emails from my colleagues asking for the top students from our program. And I feed them, those students. Uh, in fact, just yesterday, a student asked me about finding a job here in the Bay Area, and I could email, immediately email colleagues at four companies, one early stage startup, one late stage startup, and two large uh, engineering companies. So uh, the options are certainly available to that student as, as they are to all our students. So let's move on and talk about how students support each other. So this is definitely a good place to start with uh, you, Sophia. Okay, um, well, people here at Berkeley in civil engineering are really collaborative. I know Berkeley has this reputation for being a really competitive school, but I found that people are always willing to work together and help each other out. I always do my problem sets with my friends in class, or from class, not in class. Um, <laughs> and, um, there's lots of resources that students put on. For example, in the Civil Engineering Honor Society, we put on free tutoring for the uh, lower division classes. And it's just a really great place to be. Everyone's really friendly, and you get to know them outside of class, too. So I like it here. Curtis, what's your experience with students supporting each other? The students definitely support each other, um, especially with homework assignments or just other classwork. I always tend to do my classwork in our third floor computer lab because you can always almost find someone in there working on the same homework assignment you are. And so it's a great resource of, e you don't need to go seek a tutor or anything, but it can just be a classmate that may be able to explain something to you or you can struggle together, which is 
misery always love company so it's a lot of fun to maybe just suffer with your friends at least instead of just suffering alone in your room so definitely the third floor computer lab has been a great resource for getting support from my fellow students and, and Joan how, how have you seen uh, students supporting each other well I just think that there's a real community here like you walk through the halls and you just see students talking to each other they're walking in groups they they know each other they're saying hello um, and once in a while, I'll have a student who's really struggling, and I know a student who can help them. And that student will always offer to help if I talk with them. So I just generally see this as a, somebody once said that they just saw civil engineering as a, its own little community within the college, within the university. And I, I really believe that. Yeah, I, I have to second that thought. I think, you know, in my short time in this department, I've you know, heard about what a great reputation this particular department has for its collegiality. The, the second point I personally want to make is, to be blunt, Berkeley Engineering at the undergrad level is no joke. It's not a walk in the park. So uh, what ends up happening is uh, students inevitably need to study with each other and learn from each other. Not all learning happens in the classroom or by yourself in the library with books. So the culture that's kind of come out of that um, what I've seen in my personal experiences on the faculty and as a student is that students really get together and help each other and, and study, and that's a huge part of the, the experience here. And when I find a student struggling, oftentimes the first question I ask them is, so who, who are your friends? Who do you study with? No one. And then you try to get them into a study group, and then you just see them bloom because they, they find a way to collaborate and they learn that they need to do that. So the students who our just students have learned to collaborate and they thrive here because of that. Great, so um, do you guys have some quick thoughts to share on this? No, I think we are benefiting from the fact that we are all housed in one building or in two buildings that are next to each other and so this vicinity helps us create a community. It's very easy for us. We're not scattered all over the campus and I think that's something that while makes for crowded quarters, makes also for good social <laughs> behavior. <Yeah. laughs> Great, so let's move on to the next topic, and that's undergraduate research. So, uh, Professor Joan Walker, could you talk about undergraduates getting yeah. involved in your lab? Yeah, um, you know, it's a good question. As I think Sophia was saying, it's pretty easy to get involved in research here. You know, you're, you're excited about a topic area, you find a professor who's working in that area, and you go talk to them. And we'll almost always take research students on our projects, and hopefully we have some money to, you know, pay for you some. Uh, as, as I, I talked before about some students who've worked in my lab, other students have actually ended up writing papers and presented at conferences, and one got a poster award at a conference, and so the undergrads here are really integrated into our research projects, and we're happy to have, have you, and it's, it's easy. <laughs> Professor Philip, who can you talk about students in your lab? So in uh, structure, students work both in uh, computer analysis and computer programs, but also work a lot in the laboratory. We have a large testing lab downstairs in the second floor of Davis Hall. So it's a great opportunity to participate with PhD students and visiting scholars from world-renowned universities on projects where they need help. Typically, undergraduates may not have all the skills for or the, all the knowledge to participate in research at a very high level for some of these advanced projects, but at the same time they can lend a hand certainly and learn a lot from the experience of more senior research personnel. So we find in the testing area a very, very useful collaboration with undergraduates, graduate students, and then visitors from other universities. Joan Chamberlain, can you comment a bit on the, on the logistics? Uh, you know, wh when should students get uh, involved in research as undergrads uh, during the so, semester in the summer. So I have students who come first week in their freshman year and they say I want to do research and and um, I'm like okay <laughs> and I'll say so why don't you get involved with the steel bridge or the environmental team and they'll think oh I don't really want to do that I want to do real research and so I'll say well why don't you try that and so they do and they find oh they're really doing re real research because on their own they're having to find solutions and then what that often very leads to is a research position because then they can go with a skill set to affect then they'll come back to me and they'll say well I did that now I really want to do real research and so I said well why don't you go see Professor Veriano you've been working in the environmental team and you've been you know he probably he may have something I heard he has some undergraduate research going and so 
they'll go and they'll talk with him. And off, most often he will give them something or he'll send them down the hall to someone else who has something. So almost every student who comes to me talking about research can find research, maybe not exactly how they envisioned research. Maybe they thought they'd do environmental research and they end up with Joan Walker doing transportation research. But the the theory of research applies to all aspects of it. So while it might not be exactly in which area you wanted to do research, a student who wants to do research can find research here. So speaking of environmental research and Professor Mariano's lab, Sophia, can you comment on your experience? Yeah, um, well, I mentioned it a little bit earlier. I've been working with Professor Variano studying these reeds in the wetlands. and. Um, I'm working with another girl um, who I have classes with on this project, and right now we're working with a Microsoft Connect, which is kind of like their version of a Wii. I hadn't actually heard of it before I got involved with this, and I guess I'm not a big gamer. Um, but <laughs> so we're trying to use the Connect. Um, basically what we would do is put some kind of like red dot or a sticker on a read and then film it with the Connect and see like the amplitude of its waving and the period and then that will help us determine how it'll affect mixing in the water. So right now my research buddy and I are working on trying to figure out the code to communicate with the Connect so that we can get the camera data from it and then work with that. Great, so I think we wanna leave ample time for Q&A so that you can share your concerns with us. So do, do we have some questions queued up? Ah, can I study abroad? Okay, so this is a great question. Let's see, perhaps we should start with Joan Chamberlain here. Yes, study abroad is really encouraged, especially in civil engineering, because civil engineering is an international practice. Um, the department believes in it so heavily that we have a faculty member devoted to working with our students, Cara Nelson, who keeps extensive files on which courses translate into Berkeley courses and which courses may not work and uh, where students have gone and what experiences they've had there. The College of Engineering has become so supportive of it that students who study abroad can have an extra semester at Berkeley if they need to when they come back. So when I first came here 10 years ago, I would say, less than a quarter of our students went abroad, and it's much, much closer to over a third now that are going and studying abroad. Having wonderful experiences in Spain and New Zealand and Australia, and um, yeah, just all over. Curtis, Sophia, have either of you studied abroad? Um, I haven't studied abroad um, really, but I did get to go abroad through a summer program doing research, so it's kind of like studying abroad, but even better, I thought. Um, there's a program here at Cal called the Cal Energy Corps, which has paid research internships for undergraduates all around the world. So I got to go to Hong Kong and do research on the urban heat island effect there, which was super awesome. I'd never been to Asia before, and that was my first experience with research. I was um, writing a program in MATLAB, which is the computer program you use mostly if you're an engineer other than the computer science electrical engineers. And so I wrote a program in there that would simulate how um, solar radiation was interacting with buildings and how that would affect temperatures there, and then got to write a research paper about it. Um, and I spent a lot of time traveling on the weekends. I got to go to Singapore and Taiwan and Macau and Japan. So it was a really great experience. And I think there's a lot of opportunities here to travel. Sounds pretty tough. <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of culture shock, <laughs> but I made it through. <laughs> Uh, Professor Philippou, can you say something about studying abroad? Yes, uh, all I can say is that, first of all, it's an extremely valuable experience. I encourage my students to try to accomplish this if possible. It requires a little bit of advanced planning. As Joan said, one has to really try to match the courses abroad to the courses here and make sure that they find a way if they're going to go, for example, to countries that have very different standards than the uh, Anglo-Saxon standards, that they uh, at that time choose to do elective courses. But it is something that is very valuable because it broadens your perspectives. It uh, gives you a completely different view of some of the engineering subjects you are studying here, and so you tend to be less insular. And uh, it opens possibilities uh, with uh, work abroad and foreign languages and cultures that is maybe not open to students who remain in this country. So I think it's very, very important. 
Great, thank you. Let's. Scott, uh, could I just add sure. that because of the 15 units of technical electives that now can be taken anywhere in the College of Engineering, that almost all of the students going abroad are able to transfer at least one or two classes back to their technical electives. It's opened that area up quite a bit. So students really can do both abroad, do their engineering work and their, and their abroad experience. That's an important practical issue to consider when you need to graduate. Yes, it is. <laughs> so the, the, the next question, um, I'm going to start with you, Professor Walker. Okay. So, so the department is entitled Civil and Environmental Engineering. Uh -huh. Do students need to specialize in either civil or environmental engineering? Ah, yeah, good question. I mean, not only civil and environmental, but we have structural and geotech and transportation and systems. And I mean, what I would say to, as an undergraduate level is that it's good to explore all these things. This, um, you can specialize if you want. Typically, uh, the master's level is where people specialize in civil engineering. So I think it's good to explore and keep your opportunities open at the undergrad level. That said, if you come in and you know you're interested in one thing or you come across something that you're passionate about, then you can specialize in that area. But it's really up to you. Concur. Concur. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. What's, what's your guys' perspective as students about... Uh, the, the breadth or specialization in, within civil environmental engineering? You definitely get to have a wide variety of classes. We were required to take four core classes from a list of, I want to say, six or seven. Um, and that definitely opens up your perspective to different sides. I'm currently in a transportation class, which is really different but really interesting at the same time. Um, and I see how it correlates to all my other classes and the way you think about it the same. But I chose to, I fell in love with structural engineering, so I chose to make my elective classes those classes. but Definitely you have a chance to get, experience everything and really get a better understanding and see how everything, the problems that you solve may be different, but the way you approach them and the way you solve them are very similar. Um, yeah, I always knew that I was interested uh, more in the environmental side of this department, but I've also really enjoyed um, these core requirements Curtis mentioned and taking classes, learning other aspects of civil engineering. I'm taking the geotechnical core class right now, which I really enjoyed. I didn't really think about that subject at all much before I took this class, and it's been really cool learning about soil mechanics and how buildings work with that. And I'm also taking the structural engineering core class right now, which seems really useful to know, even though I don't foresee myself going into that. But it's still been a really good class. Yeah, let me, let me add that uh, one way you could think about uh, the, the curriculum here is it's in some ways a design your own. So uh, the, the first two years are more or less prescribed for, for all engineers, and, and your uh, junior and senior years are where you take these upper division classes, which are a bit more specialized. And uh, there's some flexibility in the electives there where you can essentially focus on, you know, be it environmental, structures, systems, if you're into programming, you can take uh, CS type classes, so on and so forth. So uh, the way to make the answer to that question concrete is really to look at the course catalog, uh, look at the uh, required curriculum, and, and basically try to map out what you would like your civil environmental engineering degree uh, look like. Uh, so with that, let's go on to the next question, which was related to this comment of, of MATLAB. So, uh, <laughs> So, so programming has become, you know, increasingly more involved in civil environmental engineering. So, uh, the question is, if if I don't know programming, then uh, what do I do? How can I learn programming, Professor Bailey? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a very good question. So, if you don't know programming, I guess uh, sooner or later you will have to be thrown into the ocean, which is swimming with MATLAB, which is our freshman course on. Uh, on uh, introduction to basic programming concepts. We use MATLAB because it's a very user-friendly language. I personally find it a very, very accessible kind of uh, tool. And all it takes is maybe shedding a little bit the fear that some people have of, uh, for computers. And you would pretty soon realize that with the help of teams and others and professors and graduate assistants that you will be able to enjoy actually the experience. And when you see the applications of these tools to later in later courses, you will realize that it's a great investment in your time. So interestingly enough, Sophia on her laptop here had MATLAB open before we even started <laughs> working. So can you talk about uh, learning MATLAB and just programming in, in general here? 
Um, yeah, so you take this class called E7, which is the class where you learn MATLAB. And I was a little intimidated at first because I didn't have any programming experience, but it's a good class because they literally start from the beginning and don't expect you to know anything. And um, everyone, it's a big class, so all your friends who are engineers will be in there too. Um, I took it in the spring and my friends and I would always do our programming homework out in the courtyard outside our dorm and try to tan and write code at the same time, which <laughs> wasn't always that productive because it's hard to see your computer screen in the sun, but you know, at least I got to be outdoors while learning to program. Berkeley problems, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Curtis, uh, how about you? What's been your experience learning programming? Um, so I also took E7 at the same time as Sophia, and I was not a huge fan of the class at the time. Programming was not my forte, um, but as it's come up more and more in other classes, we have a couple of similar engineering classes that it comes up in that you need to know MATLAB. I've gotten more, I guess I've gotten a stronger understanding of how to use it, and it's, I've come to like it a little more and see how useful it can be. Um, currently in Professor Philippou's class, we have to use it at times, and definitely in that, I can see it's how powerful it is and how useful it can be as a tool to help solve our problems. Yeah, I'd like to comment that programming these days, I, I would argue, is an essential tool for an engineer. And what's nice about this uh, E7 class, this introduction to, to programming, is where you learn tools like MATLAB. This is, uh, this is an industry standard in, in many, many industries. So it's uh, coming back to this career preparation question. Uh, it's, it's very helpful for getting a job later if you, if you know uh, MATLAB and, and other programming uh, languages in general. So any other comments about programming? You, right. know, you know, if I, if I may say something, you know, this, for many people, uh, civil engineering may be associated with some traditional uh, areas of application, be it environmental, being uh, water resources, being structural. But you don't realize maybe at this stage that many of our students are also employed uh, in areas like aerospace, um, space missions. Uh, we have former students that are working at JPL in the Mars mission. And for those applications, uh, applications basically that are at the cutting edge of science, I think powerful programming uh, tools and uh, programming abilities, I think, play a very important role. So you may think that for certain kinds of more traditional applications, let's say a one-story house or two-story house, that may not be necessary, which is true, but then for more advanced applications, this plays a very important role. So you open your horizons if you have those abilities. Great, so, so we have another very good question coming up here, and I'm, I'm gonna come to you, uh, Joan Chamberlain. So, so the question is, how much room is there in the schedule to take non-technical electives? Well, the college actually requires that you take six courses that are in the humanities. Um, so right there you have six classes that you're taking. But for most of our students, um, the degree requires 120 units, including these six classes. And because many of our students come in with AP, it's very common for a student to get a minor, which is another five classes. And we've had students get minors in music and in drama and in English and Spanish. So, I mean, it's across the board. So, um, there, it's easy to take, it's, it's not, I mean, you have to plan it and, you know, sometimes you can't take the class you exactly want to take because you have to take a required class. But for the most part, I find our students are able to take classes outside when they plan and they want to. Curtis, can you talk about taking non-technical electives? Um, so, I've taken five of my six non-technical electives so far. Um, my freshman year, I took our two writing classes, which I th going into freshman year, I was like, I'm not going to like writing that much. I was never a strong writer in high school. And I actually really fell in love with my rhetoric class, and I never thought I would. And I was actually doing all my reading, really getting into my readings and getting into my analysis. And so it's actually it was great to see that I do have other interests. And besides just my engineering and my math and my science, that I can see the interest in reading and rhetoric and that carried over into some of my other classes when I took a history class and my poli sci class, and it's great to get a better understanding of what's going on in the world and get away from our corner of campus a little bit and meet other people at this great university. 
Sophia, what non-technical electives have you taken? Um, so my favorite ones that I've taken are in the Scandinavian department because my family's from Sweden, so I was interested in learning more about my heritage. I took a class on Viking history, which was the most awesome class in the whole world. Some days we would go in there and our professor would just talk about Viking weaponry for an hour, and it was awesome. And yeah, like Curtis said, it's just nice to get away from the engineering corner and learn about something completely different. Um, I also took a language class in Finnish, which was fun. Um, I really wanted to take a Scandinavian language because I speak Swedish, but my Swedish was too advanced for the Swedish we have here. So I picked Finnish because it's completely unrelated to Sweden, even though they're neighbors. And it was a very bizarre language, but it was a lot of fun just thinking in a really different way. And the class was tiny. It had maybe 10 people. So it was just fun hanging out and doing something really different from my normal coursework. I'd, I'd like to add that, uh, of course, we have a top civil environmental engineering department, but newsflash, the other departments are excellent as well. Yeah, almost so, all are in the top 10, actually. The yes. philosophy of Berkeley is that we do everything and we do everything well. And so almost every single department on campus is in the top 10, and except medicine. We don't do medicine. That's at UCSF. Yeah, but we, we have a medical Nobel laureate just recently. Uh, that's right. <laughs> well, we, we don't have... Uh, a, our own medical school, but we yeah. have our own university across yeah. the bay, <laughs> exactly. UCSF. Uh, point being, I think it's a travesty if undergraduates don't take advantage exactly. of these other departments. Exactly. So uh, let, let's move on to this next question here. So actually, I want to start with you, okay. uh, Joan. So the question is, this is a good one for you. In what ways do faculty and students work across department boundaries. Ah, yeah, that is a good question. You know, I have to say when we were talking about how students support each other and like each other and it's such a cooperative environment, partly what I was thinking is that the faculty here really support and like each other and it's a cooperative environment. So the world now is so interdisciplinary. I'm in transportation and I work with people, faculty in political science, in urban planning, in economics, in psychology, and, um, and it's really easy to cross those boundaries. Now the way the funding organizations work, the funding organizations also want to see interdiscipl interdisciplinary collaborations. And within these collaborations, we have students working on our projects. So students also get exposed to these uh, different ways of thinking. And it's one of the great things about being at Berkeley. <laughs> Absolutely. Professor Philippou, can you talk about working across department boundaries? Across department boundaries is uh, very easy at Berkeley as uh, my colleague said it's a very um, open environment. Uh, typically in, in structures, we uh, collaborate a lot with people either in the technical fields like computer science, mechanical engineering, because there are issues of energy, there are issues of uh, mechanics and all sorts of fluids that we are interested in. But then across the campus, we cooperate with people in arts and architecture because uh, structures, of course, also have certain artistic attributes. There are also certain aspects of design that we cover in that. And so we have a number of minors. Uh, one of the minors we have in the department is a minor where students in civil engineering can minor in architecture, which then opens the door for possibilities for them to do a joint uh, graduate degree between architecture and, and structural engineering. And those foster the kinds of collaborations with faculty that we find extremely useful. Just today, actually, I was having coffee with a colleague who's in integrative biology who was talking to me about a robot that he's created inspired by watching how iguanas jump. So this robot has a tail on it, and they can actually actuate this tail and get the robot car to jump over um, obstacles with this tail using this this inertial. So because he and I both understand something about systems and controls, we speak the same language. Uh, whereas I think about infrastructure, he thinks about biology, yet, you know, we have these conversations all the time, and that's some of the most fascinating conversations really happen at that intersection. Uh, so let's move on to the next question here. So this is from a student interested in structural engineering, so we're going to come back to you. So it's a practical question. The question is, if I were to buy a computer, which computer should I buy? <laughs> well, that's a very tough question <laughs> to ask of a structural engineer. Uh, I, first of all, in some way, one can be 
uh, may be a little bit uh, facetious and say, well, you don't really need a computer because we have plenty of computers in the building. You can always live with the computers available in the computer labs. So if I were going to buy a computer in your place, I would maybe buy something that is portable. I can take with me on trips uh, when I visit the family, so maybe a laptop would be the better choice. Um, we don't need very powerful software, really, in some ways, because we are solving conceptual problems for the most part, so the problem sizes are small. So any typical laptop, I think, would do just fine. Great. I think that's a, that's a good answer to that practical question. Let's, uh, let's go to the next one, actually. I'm going to come to you, Sophia. So, so the question is, I want to study how to bring clean water to, to everybody. Uh, and then uh, join the Peace Corps. So uh, is environmental engineering an obvious fit for this, but how will the civil engineering aspect help, help me if I'm interested in that? Um, okay, well, definitely environmental engineering would teach you lots of things about water treatment and stuff like that. But I think just the interdisciplinary nature of learning all the aspects of civil engineering is helpful because you might encounter some problems. Maybe you'd have to build something structural to enact your water filtration plant. And so then you might need to know some structural engineering or um, maybe, I don't know, you would have to dig into the groundwater and you might need to know some geotechnical or geoenvironmental knowledge. So I think it's good just being exposed to all those aspects. And um, outside of class here, I know a lot of civil engineers are involved in Engineers Without Borders, which does basically exactly that. They have a project in Peru where they're doing arsenic remediation in the water and helping bring clean water to people. So Berkeley is a great place both to learn about stuff like that in the classroom and then also go out and use that knowledge and actually make people's lives better out in the world. Uh, I just want to add to that that uh, I think you could answer that question by thinking about how will Berkeley help you. If you want to bring clean water to people, this is a people problem. And it's important to understand societies, developing communities. And uh, again, this is an opportunity to take advantage of uh, classes outside the department that focus on those sorts of sorts of issues. And I can speak to that. So I talked about this cl cross-campus collaboration. One of the projects I'm working on now, it's eight faculty around campus. And it involves Cara Nelson, who's one of our professors here. Um, and uh, other people in both water and transport. And what we're looking at is interdisciplinary ways to look at global cities and how to provide clean water and also good transportation in a way that's sustainable and equitable and efficient. And um, so there are two of us in this group of eight from civil engineering, one on the water side, one on the transport side, and then people from urban planning and political science and applied economics and, uh, and also computer science. And so we're trying to address exactly those issues. Great, let's move on to the next question, and, and I think this would be a good one for you, Joan. Uh, so the question is, can you list some clubs and teams that are part of CEE? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we have the Steel Bridge, which just took first at Midpac, and will be defending their national championship in, in uh, May. And then we have Engineers Without Borders. We have the Concrete Canoe Team. We have the Environmental Team, which works on a water filtration problem. Um, and we have our seismic team that will be tra will builds a balsa wood building that will actually be placed on a seismic shake table and shaken to see how it holds up. Um, in addition, we have our American Society of Civil Engineers that uh, bring in professionals every month um, to talk about all the different infrastructure projects that are going on in the Bay Area, and they arrange site visits and really practical kinds of things, resume workshops and interview workshops, very much the professional side of civil engineering. We have our Chi Epsilon Honor Society, which is, you know, very active in our department with um, providing undergraduate advising night and the tutoring room. Um, and then there's just a whole group of clubs that kind of peripherally touch on us that our students are very involved in. Um, so, and there's a lot of students involved also with the Global Poverty Minor, which is very active and kind of its own little subset. So there, I, there is just so many different ways for students to get involved. The, the, the big fear is getting too involved <laughs> that, for me. I worry, you know, because it, there's just so many things. And our, every student who seems to come here is just so interested in so many things. That kind of trying to decide where you want to spend your time becomes, the I think, the problem. It's a good problem to have. 
Yeah, time management really hits in the face of a lot of these yes. incoming students. Curtis, it, it's correct that you're on the Steel Bridge team? Correct. Take us into some depth of <laughs> what the Steel Bridge team is. Um, so we are a student competition team. We compete in a competition every year where we design and build a steel bridge. This year's bridge happens to be about 17 feet long, and it weighs about 93 pounds, and we load it with a total of 2,500 pounds. Um, and so in the fall, we spend all semester designing um, the bridge through, we use AutoCAD as our design software and then SAP as our analysis. And then we spend the beginning of the spring semester actually fabricating the bridge ourselves. So that's my, one of my favorite parts is actually getting to work in the machine shop and getting to cut the steel, grind the steel, use the mill, use the lathe, and just work with my hands and really see how it all comes together. And then we have a competition every year. Um, as Joan mentioned, we just won mid-pack uh, two weekends ago, which is our regional competition, which also the environmental team and the concrete canoe team compete at. And then we're going to head to Akron, Ohio at the end of May for the national competition. Professor Falupu, where, where do you build a bridge that big? Hmm. And the steel bridge team. Oh, where do they build a bridge that yeah. big? Well, <laughs> our, our lab can fit many bridges that size. <laughs> <laughs> It's quite, uh, quite, quite small relative to the size of our lab, so I don't think there is a problem. It's uh, where you find the good people to actually build the bridge. That's the question. And that's how, we, how big is we it? Have plenty. Well, 70 foot long, 93-pound uh, weight, so it's really a good size, but yet not something that is kind of out of this world. So it's not, it's not too bad, something that can be built rather fast. In addition to faculty, we have a wonderful lab staff that work with the students and are available to them both in the concrete area and in the, in the, um, in the steel fabrication area. So th the lab staff spend quite a bit of time with the students helping them. Joan, when you were an undergrad, what, yes. uh, what groups were you involved with? And, oh, and was gosh, a, do I get to a brag? Yeah, let's hear about that. So uh, when I was an undergrad, it was a long time ago, but Concrete Canoe was the thing. Steel Bridge was just coming on board, but um, so I was on the Concrete Canoe team. I was in ASCE. I was in the Society of Women Engineers. And the Concrete Canoe team, we were national champions. And I was a rower. It was all fun. I have very good memories. We even had faculty <laughs> row at the time. Right? Yeah, the yeah, I remember true, I rowed a few true. times. That's <laughs> true. <laughs> it was good. Yeah. yeah. Good fun. Great. So next question is uh, for Joan. Actually, the answer might be Joan. So the question is, <laughs> who can advise me on classes and who provides course advising so I take the right things at the right time? So in CE, you have three advisors. So you have me as the departmental advisor, and I have drop-in hours from 9 to 12 and 1 to 4 every day. And then you also have a faculty advisor who is available to you to talk about coursework whenever you need to. And in addition to that, you have a college advisor who keeps you on track. So it's very, very difficult to, you have many sources available to you, and you, so it's very difficult to not be able to find help in that area. Uh, let's see, Curtis or Sophia? Maybe we'll start with Curtis. So how has it been uh, trying to navigate the uh, curriculum here and, and taking the right courses at the right time? Um, it's actually been fairly easy. I do go to my advisor, my faculty advisor, and Joan, um, but also a lot of the time I just go to my friends who are older than me and just have taken the classes already as advice on just what classes to take, making sure I'm taking them in the right order, maybe on professors, hence on professors, um, what course load may be a little too much with what uh, my other activities are. And so definitely also the utilization of your friends and older students is great as well. They can really tell you which professors to <laughs> shoot for and which ones to avoid as well, right? Yeah. <laughs> which are none, I'm sure. Which are none. <laughs> not in the civil none, environment. None in civil, <laughs> none in the civil, civil environmental <laughs> engineering. They're all, they're all excellent. Uh, okay, so, so this is an excellent question. Uh, so we'll have you start, Sophia. The question is, uh, will I get lost in a, such a big class? Definitely not. Um, I mean, you will have kind of big classes in the beginning when you're taking just kind of introductory math and physics, but I don't think it's so big that you'll feel lost, or at least I haven't felt lost. And especially once you get into the civil engineering, to classes, civil engineering classes, they're not nearly as big as the other ones. 
and you have a lot of the same people in all your classes, so there's always familiar faces, and all the civil engineering faculty are so approachable, and they really try to learn your name, so it feels a lot smaller, and so it doesn't feel like you're wandering around on this giant campus, especially within civil engineering. All your classes are in this building, you know everyone soon enough, so it's like a little family. Professor Walker, are these undergraduate students just numbers? Are they faces? I mean, how do you, uh, what do you do to try to prevent them from feeling lost in Yeah, in a it's school? a good question. I mean, um, I'm, ha I'm so happy to hear you guys say that we're accessible. I mean, I think we try to be accessible and we try to be friendly. I actually get angry at my class because they don't come and see me in office hours. You know, we want to help. And so um, we do our best to learn names. There are, there are a lot of undergrads, but um, I would say I would be happier if more students were coming to me. It's, um, you know, it's what we're here for, so. And I can't tell you the number of times that a faculty member has come in and said, so-and-so has not been in my class for a week. Do you know what's going on? Mm -hmm. And that happens routinely. So I, faculty really do notice if you're not showing up. Yeah. And they do come to see someone to see, to see if there's something going on or if they can help. Right, and in my classes, I come into to lab and you know I help students with their with the questions that they have but we'll often also just have conversations about the football team and you know some history about Cal and um, it's just fun to get to know them as as individuals so uh, the next question uh, let's see let's go with the students here so we'll start with you Curtis can I graduate in four years of course, it's actually really easy to graduate in four years. Um, I'm planning out my semester or my two semesters for my senior year and I'm actually gonna have open units almost in my last semester where I have open space and I came in with, I AP'd out of one class basically. So even without ha not having a lot of AP credits, it is more than doable to graduate in four years and be out of here. They actually kind of want to get you out into the real world and not have you sitting around too much. Sophia, are you gonna graduate in four years? Yes, I am. <laughs> um, as Chris said, it's really easy. Um, in addition to my major, I did a minor in energy engineering and I'm still gonna finish totally on time. It's honestly not even that stressful. I'm only taking 12 units, well, okay. I mean, sometimes it's stressful and hard, but not <laughs> in regards to like trying to fit in all the classes. Um, senior year, I just have to take 12 units both semesters, which is the minimum. And I did stuff in addition to my major and didn't use an insane amount of AP credit to get out of engineering things. I think I only got out of one of my technical classes in the beginning and then used a couple of my humanities AP credits. And Joan, you, you've been helping a, a number of students. I mean, how can they graduate in four years? What The what only have you students seen? who do not graduate in four years are students who go abroad and choose to use another semester when they come back or students who fail classes, and we have to hold them over so they can graduate. But other than that, there are no students who do not graduate in their allocated time. Great. So we have two closing questions here, and I absolutely love these questions. Uh, let's see, so maybe the first one, we'll start with Professor Philip Hoop. So, so the first one is, what makes Berkeley unique? Oh. <laughs> Uh, well, which one of many of many ways? Uh, let's start with the obvious ones. Uh, is there a greater place to live in the world than the Bay Area? I have been many parts of the world. I personally come from uh, Greece. I was born in a country that is considered a very beautiful country, but I will bet you anything that there is very few places in the world that matches the Bay Area. Is there a place in the world with a more variety of uh, people? Uh, cultures, languages, uh, food, uh, uh, habits, I challenge you to find one. Uh, is there a greater concentration of intellectual power than the Bay Area? The only place I compare it with uh, would be Cambridge, Massachusetts. So unless you're planning to go to Harvard or MIT, I would be hard pressed to find an equivalent place to Stanford, Berkeley and the other schools we have in this area. Uh, is there a greater department in the world than UC Berkeley Civil and Environmental Engineering? I would be hard pressed to pick one, but uh, you are welcome to challenge me on that, so I conclude with that. 
What's your view, Professor Walker? Gosh, I would ditto all of that. That was a great list. I mean, when, when I think of Berkeley, I think it's, um, you know, people who really love this place. I mean, think it's just the great experience. And also, I think people really working together to try to make the world a better place, a real drive to, um, you know, improve society both domestically and internationally. If I were to pick one word to describe Berkeley, it would be unique. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I absolutely agree with these lists. Um, it's a place where you really live in the world because the world comes here in terms of their culture and their intellect. So uh, let's, let's continue on with the students here with a, with a second question. So second question is, why is Berkeley a great choice? So why was it a great choice for you, Sophia? Um, well, when I was looking at schools, I came to Berkeley on an overnight stay program, and I think just the people that I met while I was here visiting were just so amazing that I couldn't imagine going anywhere else. And you're going to be here for four years with the people in your classes and around you on campus, so I think it's important that you find a place where you feel like the people around you are inspiring and friendly, but humble and they're all just so involved and interested in everything. So I just really love the people here, and I'm glad I picked Berkeley. Curtis, why was Berkeley a great choice for you? I have to echo Sophia on the fact that it's the people that make Berkeley one of the greatest places in the world, and I love it so much because of that. I have a number of friends that are from different parts of the world, and it's just I never thought I'd have friends from Pakistan or China, and it's just been a great opening for me and just to meet people from different cultures and different lifestyles and I just love the diversity that Berkeley has and it's helped me to broaden my perspective and just really helped me to grow as a person. Mm -hmm. Joan, what feedback have, have you gotten from all the students you advise about? I think they just feel it's such a unique diverse place and that no matter you know whether they're the, the pocket nerd or whether they're you know the athlete there's a place for them here and yeah. you can be both the pocket nerd and the athlete yeah. um, and nobody looks at you like you're odd um, where you might be on another campus. Right great. Uh, so let's see I think now we'll we'll close so we'll, we'll close with just some, some last comments that uh, you would like to make to, to share with these prospective students. So Professor Philippou, if you could start us off. Wow. <laughs> well, I, I, have to, I have a hard time get close, with the closing comments. All I can say is that um, I think in some ways the decision you're going to make which call to attend is a very personal one. In uh, many ways, people select the place that they feel most comfortable with. So no matter what we say here about the great place that Berkeley is, which suits our needs, at the end of the day, you will choose a place that makes you, uh, that comes closest to your wishes and to your needs. Uh, if there is anything that we at this side can answer uh, with uh, email or questions or phone calls, uh, let us know, because at the end of the day, you want to make an informed decision. But I'm sure that uh, whatever decision you make is going to be a successful one for you, because you will make it happen. That's great. Um, so I would say, you know, come here. I think you'll love it. And if for some reason when you get here and it doesn't seem to be fitting, then come talk to us. Come talk to the faculty, the students, the staff, and we'll make sure that, you know, it, it gets to a place where it works for you. Sophia? Um, I think people are really happy at Berkeley, and college is supposed to be a really awesome experience, so you want to go somewhere where you'll be happy. I remember touring schools and sometimes walking around campuses, and people looked really depressed, and that would be really sad if you spent four years being depressed, and Berkeley just has so many amazing things going on all the time. There's no way you could be bored or lonely, so it's just the greatest place ever. <laughs> Curtis. Um, I just have to basically echo everyone else on this. Berkeley is a fabulous place, and I love going to school here, and I cannot imagine going anywhere else. And just, but when you do come here, make sure you join groups, make sure you meet new people, just put yourself out there. You don't know who you're going to meet on this campus and what they might do to help you grow as a person. I love working at Berkeley because every day I am so challenged by our students and our faculty. It is just you just can never float. You are always being constantly challenged and growing. And after 30 years, I'm still growing. Um, and so I think if you want to grow, 
this is the place for you. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll close with just the comment that if your goal is to get an education where you get basically an engineering degree and you get a good job, uh, then you don't really get everything that Berkeley is about. Because our students are capable, I think, of much, much more. These are the leaders, right, um, that will go out there. I think what's unique about a place like this and what makes it such a great choice is the exposure to so many different ideas, students who really want to make a definitive difference in the world, who are willing to think differently, challenge convention, and have the tools and leadership and ability and teamwork to get that done. If that's something that's appealing to you, then this is, this is the type of place for you. So with that, I think we will uh, close this town hall. Of course, if you have any uh, questions, feel free to send any of us emails. You can find us on the Civil Environmental Engineering homepage. We thank you very much.